Welcome to Investing Compass. A quick note that the information contained in this podcast is general in nature. It does not take into consideration your personal situation, circumstances, or needs. So today we're going to discuss one of many retirement withdrawal strategies, and we're going to discuss the bucket withdrawal strategy. But before we do, let's have a chat about the team day that we're going to have, Mark. The, the team day? Yeah. We're like gonna... the potluck thing? <laughs> yeah. So it's like, a, it's like Harmony Day where everyone brings in a dish from their culture. So, I've never heard of Harmony Day, by the way. Maybe you're not very harmonious. I was one that organized this. <laughs> um, but I wanted to ask you, Mark, are you going to make US or Australian food? Because you're a citizen now. Yeah, I don't know. I, I volunteered to bring the alcohol. So I could bring, I could bring Passion Pop. Yes. You That's... had your first Passion Pop taste in the office. Yeah, because you told me I had to do three things to become an Australian. One was to drink Passion Pop. Yes. And so Shawnee... I mean, this list was really just about embarrassing Mark, but... <laughs> well, yes, yes. Your favorite activity. Shawnee got a bottle of Passion Pop, mm -hmm. and then she put a Post-it note on it saying, property of Mark LaMonica, and she put it in our fridge, fridge at So work. everyone could see it. And then she got this tray... And you put umbrellas in the glasses. In the champagne flutes. And you brought it out to me and yes. you put it on my desk. Mm -hmm. And then my boss walked by. Who is like the MD of Australia. <laughs> yeah. And turned and looked and then turned back and looked when he saw it was Passion Pop and just shook his head and walked away. Mm. A highlight. Of your life? Oh, uh, no, of your career. Yeah. It's surprising I still have one. <laughs> okay. All right. Well, we, we can update everyone on... Harmony Day or whatever mm -hmm. you call it, once we actually decide what we're going to make. Yes. So let's get into bucket portfolios because mm -hmm. that's exciting, right? And, you know, we're not necessarily obviously saying that we think that this is the best path for retirees to follow. So just like everything else in investing, it's completely determined by your personal circumstances and what works for you. But it is something that we're a proponent of at Morningstar. So Morningstar's director of personal finance in the US, a woman named Christine Benz, has done in-depth research into this particular strategy and the bucket withdrawal method. So what we'll do today is we'll go through what the strategy is, the type of lifestyle it may suit, and then go through some details on how to plan for this. All right. So uh, it may seem like this episode is only really relevant for retirees and pre-retirees, but I think the information in this podcast can help any investor that's planning for a comfortable retirement. So let's get started with what it is, Mark. And if it's relevant for pre-retirees, isn't that everyone? Pretty much. Like your I mean, first I think... <laughs> day of work, you're yeah. a pre-retiree. I mean, that's a bit of jargon, I guess. You call pre-retirees five years from retirement, but you are right, Mark. Technically, it's everybody. <laughs> no, I, I know. I was just being a bit of a jerk about <laughs> okay. it. But anyway, in the simplest terms, a bucket strategy is a retirement withdrawal approach that involves a diversified portfolio with various timeframes that are structured to help you meet your income needs in retirement. Exactly. And this strategy came from a financial planner in the mid-1980s. The financial planner was Harold Evensky. And really, this was a strategy that addressed one of the most common problems. Many retirees don't have enough of capital base to draw down a stable and reliable income and guarantee that their funds will last as long as they do. And the ideal scenario for a retiree is that they have enough money so that they can live off of the income that their portfolio generates. So we covered this concept in a couple of our passive income episodes, and it really is the investor dream. So instead of having to work, your portfolio pays for your life by generating dividends and interest. And the advantage of this scenario is that it doesn't matter what the market does. It goes up, it goes down, but you just keep collecting and spending your dividends. And you never run out of money because you aren't selling off any of your assets. They're just being used to generate income. And because you don't sell any of your assets off and just rely on income, it means that you aren't worried about the bad luck of retiring into a bear market. And this is a big problem for retirees because as we've talked about before, it isn't just the average return you earn, but also the order of the returns that you get that matters. Having the bad luck to retire and then have the market drop makes it more likely that you'll run out of money because while it's dropping, you're selling off your portfolio to pay for your life. That means that there's less money in your portfolio to grow whenever the market recovers. And what Shawnee just described there are the twin risks in retirement. So sequencing risk or the risk that the order of your returns is unlucky with negative returns early in retirement 
And then longevity risk, which is the risk that you run out of money before you die. And just living off your passive income from your portfolio solves both of these problems. So why doesn't everybody just do that? Well, the simple answer is you need a ton of money, especially given how low dividend yields are and interest rates are right now. And not only do you need a big enough portfolio to support an income level high enough to live off of, but you also need a buffer because dividends, of course, fluctuate. Companies aren't doing well or the economy isn't doing well. Dividends get cut. And we saw this during 2020, and we saw this during the GFC when the S&P 500 dividend level fell by 25%. And finally, you need that income to keep growing because of inflation. So this is a pretty tall order. So living off just your income is impossible for most people. In that case, we're looking for ways to sell off our assets to fund our lives while dealing with the twin risks of retirement, longevity, and sequencing. So this strategy has been designed to help retirees create a paycheck from their investment assets. And so the strategy is based on the simple premise that the worst thing an investor can do is be forced to sell at a bad time in the market. As we've stressed multiple times, that is all we're trying to avoid as investors. That is why we have an emergency fund. We have an emergency fund because we don't want to have to sell shares if our car breaks down, because our car might break down when the market is plummeting and we don't want to sell low. And that is all the bucket method is, a way to sell shares when it's a good time to sell them. Short-term spending needs are kept in cash. Longer-term needs are kept in investments that may bounce around in value in the short term, but will earn higher long-term returns. Exactly. So retirees don't need to touch their longer-term holdings to fund their shorter-term needs. So let's go through each of the three buckets and their purpose. Christine Benz has actually written up an article that goes through the exact assets that might fit in these buckets, but it's US-centric and dependent on whether you need an aggressive or conservative portfolio in retirement. But we'll spend a little bit of time going through some of the reasons why these assets are chosen, so you're able to apply this to your own strategies if you choose a similar method. And the logical place to start, of course, is bucket number one. So that's where we'll start. And as we mentioned, this is the most liquid part of your portfolio. It's cash. And the fact that it is cash, especially now, means you are not going to earn a very good return. In fact, you might actually earn a negative real return when we start looking at inflation. But remember, the cash is simply there to address your living expenses and be your quote unquote paycheck. The goal of this part of your portfolio is to meet your income needs that may not be covered by other sources. And by other sources, we just mean something like the age pension or a defined benefit scheme you might be lucky enough to have or anything else that is a non-portfolio source of income. So to figure out how much you need in this bucket, we need to work out your annual spending needs. And so what you do is you work out what you're going to spend on an annual basis, and then you subtract the non-portfolio income sources from that. So say, for example, I have $45,000 in spending needs annually, but the age pension covers 15000 of that. That means your first bucket or your cash bucket would need $30,000. Now, more conservative investors, and I know practically a lot of investors, would want to keep more than that in their first bucket. Many who adopt this strategy multiply that annual figure up by two or three times to determine the cash holdings. Alternatively, what other investors do that are concerned about having that much of their portfolio in cash is build a two-part bucket, one year of expenses in true cash and one or more years of living expenses in a slightly higher yielding alternative holding, such as a short-term bond fund. You also need an emergency fund, so if you don't have a separate one, then add that to your first bucket or cash bucket. That will pay for unexpected costs such as car repairs, additional healthcare costs, etc. And I know there are a lot of people that just listen to what we said, what Shani said, and will balk at this. And I can just hear people saying, why would I hold so much in cash when I'm earning no return and when inflation is actually destroying the purchasing power of my cash? And I get that. But the same argu- argument can be made about not having any insurance. Sure, my family's in deep trouble if I die or can't work, but it probably won't happen, so I won't buy life insurance. It would be a really big problem if my house burned down or flooded, but that probably won't happen, so I won't buy any insurance on that. The lack of return you're getting on the cash is buying you something tangible, and that is peace of mind. Peace of mind that the risk of Putin invading Ukraine doesn't happen at a time that is inconvenient for your retirement. All right, let's move on to bucket two. And bucket two, under Christine Benz's structure, contains five or more years worth of living expenses with a goal of income production and stability. 
The reason why we call out that it is five years is because one of the best parts of the bucket withdrawal strategy is that it is just a guideline and can be reworked and redefined depending upon your personal circumstances. We'll cover this once we've outlined the buckets, but there is a spectrum of portfolio aggressiveness that you can pick your spot in through different allocations. And that bucket allocation, but also the asset allocations within the buckets. So with this bucket, it's dominated by high quality fixed income exposure, but may also include a small share of high quality dividend paying equities and other yield rich securities like hybrids. You can also use funds and ETFs in this bucket. And income distributions from this portion of your portfolio are used to refill bucket one as you use up those assets. Morningstar Investor is built for investors by investors. It provides independent research and data on over 40,000 securities, tools to build and maintain an investment portfolio, and investor education resources to support you, regardless of where you are in your investing journey. Explore opportunities with our monthly global best ideas. Explore our ETF model portfolios. Plan better with two years of dividend forecasts for ASX listed stocks. And stay informed with independent thought leadership. We've built tools to help you construct, monitor, and maintain your portfolio, including our Portfolio Manager, integrated with one of Australia's leading portfolio tracking tools, ShareSight. Morningstar has been empowering investor success for over 35 years. We're passionate about your outcomes and are here every step of the way as you achieve them. Take out a free four-week trial to access our resources. Find the details in the episode notes. All right, so that's bucket two. Let's move on to bucket three. This is the longest term portion of the portfolio, and this is where you have your more aggressive assets that naturally have more volatility. And that means you want to hold them for a longer term and not sell when the market is down. This part of the portfolio is dominated by stocks, but can contain some more volatile portions of fixed interest that may have higher long term returns like junk or high yield bonds. But of course, volatility can also go the other way. This equity-heavy portion of the portfolio has greater loss potential than buckets one and two that are invested in more conservative assets. And those buckets are in place to prevent you from tapping bucket three when it's in a slump. And this will mean that you are turning paper losses into real losses. So Mark, you've spoken about this a few times on the podcast and on uh, your webinars as well, but you help your mother with her investments and you use this strategy for her. So did you want to speak a little bit about that? Yeah. Yeah. No, absolutely. So I've actually created a two bucket option for her. And I've done that just because, you know, basically at this point, fixed interest is not a great place to be given sort of where interest rates are, where we think they're going to go. So basically, what she has is she has a inflated bucket one, which is cash. So she's got about five years worth of living expenses in cash. And then her other bucket is mostly equities, but equities that, I believe at least, will have lower volatility. So we're talking about dividend paying shares, um, shares with lower betas. And yeah, basically incomes generated in that bucket and there's selective asset sales when I think the time is appropriate. And that just refills that cash bucket. So yeah, I've used this in real life. All right. So we've gone through what these buckets look like. Let's speak about about it more practically and talk about what's inside these buckets. And as we mentioned, this is obviously a spectrum depending on your circumstances, the main being the length of your timeline in retirement. So there are two methods that Christine outlines, a conservative method geared towards retirees with a shorter timeline and a more aggressive method, and that's for longer timelines. And when we say timelines here, we are talking about how close to death you are. And this is obviously not something you can predict, but if you're 80, you're more likely closer to death than if you're 60. And we won't go through both of these today. So we'll put a couple links in to articles on this in our Investing Compass resources page. But let's take a look today at the aggressive method as an example. And this is relevant for a lot of investors, even if they might be on the shorter side of the timeline, because we've just seen yields push down right across the board. And many retirees either have to invest more aggressively or want to invest more aggressively since bonds are not looking too attractive these days. When we take a top-down view of the aggressive method, roughly 50% of the portfolio is in equities with the rest in fixed income and cash. It's definitely more stock-heavy than other in-retirement portfolios, and it's geared towards younger retirees who are comfortable with the higher volatility that comes with an equity-heavy portfolio. So when we look at bucket one, 
it's at one to two years. And the percentage of your portfolio this makes up is based on your withdrawal rate and how much you need to live. We're not going to spend time on that, but go back and listen to the Why You May Need to Rethink Your Retirement Goals episode from early January 2022 if you want to learn more about withdrawal methods. So if your withdrawal rate is 4%, this bucket makes up 4 to 8% of your portfolio. And this bucket is cash, just as liquid as you can be to fuel your living expenses. Because the time horizon is so short, it's just not worth taking any risks with it. If you're using a lower starting withdrawal rate, say, for example, you choose 3%, this bucket, of course, will be smaller. Then bucket two. This portion of the portfolio is designed to deliver slightly more income than bucket one, as well as a dash of inflation protection and capital appreciation. This, in Christine's example, holds 35% of your portfolio and holds years 3 to 10 of your living expenses, and she has allocated it to four different fixed income ETFs. These are listed in the US and are US-centric investments, but we'll link the article so you're able to see the exact ETFs if you're interested or read the full justifications for their inclusion in the model uh, bucket withdrawal strategy. I think it's worth giving it a read just because it allows you to see why the assets have been chosen and can be considerations when choosing assets for your Aussie portfolio. And these four bond funds have different allocations depending on the role that they serve in the second bucket. These roles vary from backup for bucket one, in case the income from the portfolio is insufficient to meet your needs, to working in a bit more risk to build up that return in a relatively safe manner, and of course, specific investments that protect against inflation eroding away your returns. And then we have bucket three. This is for years 11 and beyond. This is 57% of the total portfolio, also split across four assets, but with varying, varying weightings. These investments have been chosen because they are considered quality investments that have strong but stable growth potential. Naturally, there is going to be volatility in this portfolio, but investments have been chosen, keeping in mind that there is an 11-year time horizon built into this strategy. And one major part of this strategy that we need to address is that, like all investment strategies, it requires maintenance, especially over long time horizons. That's right, Mark. So we need to acknowledge that, like many things in life, plans and strategies are just that, plans and strategies, and they don't always go to plan, especially when you involve a variable as unpredictable as the market. So we have to look at maintenance strategies that are focused on ensuring that there's enough cash in bucket one, because the purpose of the bucket method is ensuring that you have enough cash to draw a paycheck from your retirement assets. And there are a few ways to do this, depending upon what suits your circumstances. You could refill bucket one with rebalancing proceeds. So this means that you sell assets that have done well in bucket two and three and fill up bucket one with that. Or you could just transfer all the income distributions that you make into bucket one and take that as your income. There are four, and it's likely a combination of both, right? Mm. We should mention that. There are four main strategies that Christine goes through. So we'll, once again, pop that link in the resources page if you're interested in looking at that in detail. And we can't end a discussion on retirement withdrawal strategies without talking about super and how it fits into the bucket withdrawal strategy. We're lucky to have such a tax-effective vehicle in Australia that helps us grow and maintain an income in our retirement. You want to utilize this in retirement planning as well as possible, and it's no different when you involve the bucket method. And I think what we have to remember here is that up to certain thresholds, you're getting a 0% tax rate. So how do you make the most of this? Well, it depends, and it depends on the type of environment that we're in and whether the share market is doing well. Bucket one, that cash bucket, can actually sit outside of super or be partially outside of super and get filled up with your required withdrawals that are necessary from an account-based pension in retirement. If you have the choice, it's always better to put higher return and in income-generating assets in the lower tax environment, and it doesn't really get any lower than 0%. It's also important to be strategic about the types of assets that are filling that cash bucket, and that can be dependent on the market as well. When markets are doing well, you might fund your lifestyle by selling shares, supplemented by the income that you've derived from those shares. When the market is doing poorly, you might fund it by selling bonds and income, so it gives equities a chance to recover and you're not locking in losses. But holding these assets inside of super means that even if you are selling appreciated assets, your tax burden will not be as large as if these assets were sitting outside of super. So in a lot of scenarios, again, it makes sense to keep cash where you might attract a marginal tax rate on income if you're battling with thresholds. All right. So we covered a lot in this episode. So we went through what a bucket strategy is, what it might look like for a retiree with a longer time horizon, 
and ways that you can maintain and live off of your portfolio throughout retirement. And we do like this strategy at Morningstar. And obviously, I like this strategy with my mother because it is a practical way of addressing the fact that retirees often do not retire with a large enough sum of money where they're able to pull paychecks from bank account interest. Like all good investing strategies, it's based around making the most of an investor's situation and giving them a practical output, a paycheck, that they're able to reasonably rely on in their retirement. The other thing I'll say is I did these webinars where I had buckets and one was a keg <laughs> and one was a whiskey, a, barrel. a whiskey barrel and then one was a bucket of fried chicken. And I was thinking, I'm like you, I was thinking about fried chicken this whole time. Right. Yeah. So we'll, we'll maybe have to get some. Yeah. But. <laughs> maybe that can be your contribution to Harmony Day. Okay, but it's in a couple of months. I yeah. some now. <laughs> but anyway, thank you guys very much for listening. We would love comments, suggestions. So comments and ratings in your podcast app, suggestions that you can send to my email address, which is in the show notes, um, or any questions you have. So thank you very much for listening. Any advice in this podcast is general advice or regulated financial advice under New Zealand law prepared by Morningstar Australasia Proprietary Limited and or Morningstar Research Limited without reference to your financial objectives, situations or needs. You should consider the advice in light of these matters and any relevant product disclosure statement before making any decision to invest. To obtain advice for your own situation, contact a financial advisor.